right, good evening. Has it been a long week for anybody else? Seems like forever since we've gathered. If you would, turn your Bibles to chapter 35. We have quite the, the chapter of contrast. In chapter 34, what we literally, historically, and in context see is a godless chapter. The name of the Lord is not mentioned once in all of chapter 34. And we remember what happened last week in chapter 34, don't we? Jacob was supposed to take his family back to Bethel, back to Hebron. But he didn't. Instead, he decided to dwell in Shechem. It's hard to live a sanctified life when you are trying to live as close to the world as possible. He decided to stay in Shechem. We have no record of his worship of any kind in Shechem. And we remember kind of the same thing with Abram, don't we? When Abram left Ur the Chaldees, we left that region of southern Mesopotamia, the Babylonian region. When he left, he was supposed to just keep on going. But instead, he kind of, instead he stayed in the north. We don't really hear anything. As soon as he crossed into the land he was supposed to go into, he built an altar in the northern section of it, kept moving to the south towards Egypt, built an altar at Bethel, and then he kept going into Egypt. So while he was outside of the land he was supposed to be in, we don't have any record of his worship. Same thing with Jacob. So then we see Jacob's daughter going out in fellowship with the world. And we see how the world treated the daughter of Jacob, Dinah, what we know is the Dinah incident. And then we see the passiveness of Jacob. We see the response of two of the sons of Jacob. We see the deceit. We see essentially um, the two sons using the covenant of the Lord in vain for deceit, deceitful gang, not just for their wrath, their vengeance, their bloodshed, but they also plundered the town. And then we see Jacob with such a fierce me, I attitude. In chapter 35, we see a contrast. We see a God-filled life. And what's important as we do move through chapter 35, even in contrast between the godless and the God-filled, we still see suffering as we're going to move through this chapter. Chapter 35 is a hard one. While we still see suffering, we'll still see death and those hard things in the life of the believer. What I really like about this chapter is we get to see revival coming to the house of Jacob. That's what we really want, isn't it? How often do we pray for revival? That's what we want to see. We want to see revival. We want to see reformation. We want to see us going back, not just as the churches, but it's spreading outside of that. All through our nation, all through the world, we want to see reformation. We want to see revival. What does that look like? It's like, well, we're going to have a revival. What's the first thing that we typically do? Yeah, pitch a tent. We're going to have a committee. (laughs) Yeah. We're going to have a committee. We're going to plan. We're going to set a date. We're going to set a time. How long does a revival last? If you see it on the billboards, it lasts for three hours, for two days. We're leaving out and we're skipping a lot of steps when we're trying to look at the concept of the revival. And what's amazing is we get to see it in its simplest and purest form in chapter 35. Cassie, you're my timekeeper. We are finishing both chapters this evening. A blessing for the rest of you. (laughs) Chapter 35, verse 1, Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled From the face of Esau, your brother. It's the first step to a revival. It's God. We cannot skip that step. It's God that brings us into that 
work. It's really hard for us to try and move into a work, to move through a door that God hasn't opened, called us into, or blessed. And it's also very important to note because it's a hard pill for a lot of us to swallow. We don't like the hard stuff. We don't like the difficult things. We don't like the painful things. I'm not just talking about the things that are in our lives, but certainly we have that personal application. But you have to remember, what is God using to move Jacob to this place of revival? He's using what just happened in Shechem. Two of his sons, the second and the third born, Simeon and Levi, slaughtered every male in the town of Shechem. Now, while Jacob had kind of that me, me, me whiny attitude at the end of chapter 34, he did bring up a good point. Everybody else is going to be really mad at me. All the rest of the inhabitants of the land of Canaan are going to be really mad. That's a problem. I do not have an army. I do not have those things that Abraham had. I do not have those things that my father Isaac had inherited. I don't have all those people. God uses the hard things to move us. That is a fact of the way of the cross. Why does God use the hard things and the painful things to move us? (laughs) Because the easy things make us comfortable. It's like, oh, this is so much fun. I'm going to stay right here. We like to camp near water. I don't like to camp way up away from the water until I have to drive 30 minutes to go try and find water. I want to camp where it's nice and easy. So if things are going to be easy, we like to gravitate and magnetize ourselves to the easy things, not the hard stuff. One of the school districts, not in Oregon, um, but in Idaho, which really caught me off guard, um, have been fiercely pushing, well, there's more than two genders. If you answer, there's more than, if you answer, there's only two genders on your test, you will fail the test. I got hit with that little piece of knowledge last, last week that we've been praying on and working through. When we see things continue to sour and decay and kind of just go the wrong direction, these are some of these things that the Lord uses to bring about His works, His will. We want to see these things in our lives. We want to see revival. We want to see reformation. God uses those hard things to show us why we need revival or why we need reformation. So the first step, we see it starting with God. God says to Jacob. And the first thing he asked, commands him to do, not ask him to do, commands him to do is arise and go to Bethel. Get up leave the area of Shechem, and go back to Bethel. Beth, house, El, God. Go back to the house of God. I think it was Barnhouse. The only cure for worldliness is a complete separation from the world. Not just from the location. That's kind of the problem, too. Not just the location, but also the lifestyle. The desires of the world. You remember a couple of weeks ago, we were discussing with um, teaching through uh, Peter, trying to pull Jesus aside and rebuking Jesus because Jesus didn't have a clear understanding, according to Peter, of what the role of the Messiah was supposed to be. So he says, Lord, shh, you're freaking everybody out with all this weirdness and going to the cross and being betrayed by the people that are supposed to be leading us to you. And Jesus says, what? Get behind me, Satan. You're mindful of the things of the world, not mindful of the things of God. If we are more mindful of the things of the world, we're not going to want to leave the things of the world. So they're called into complete separation from it. Leave Shechem and as comfortable as you are. And a lot of us, we've we've moved a whole number of times. We move in places we didn't want to move from. But the growth that has taken place once we have separated ourselves is just undeniable, especially when we're pursuing those things of God. So we see that it starts with God, step one. Step two, we need to separate separate ourselves from the world. It's really hard to pay attention to things of God when you're too focused on the things of the world. The world has its own measure of getting ahead. 
The world has its own measure and definition of greatness, something we'll continue to expound upon as we finish Mark chapter 9 this week. And the third one, you will make an altar there to God. You will resume or start that lifestyle of worship. For him to build an altar there is supposed to show foundation, roots. You're going to go, you're going to build this great big altar. Altars wouldn't have been fun to build. How many people like stacking rocks? I found out a couple weeks ago, I don't even like to stack wood. And I'm very thankful for my kids and Cassie and Kyle's kids. They have a lot more energy than I do. It takes a lot of work. It's supposed to be that way. But how much better and stronger when you're doing those things in the Lord and not in the world. Everything that we have here, it's going to pass. Which is why we shouldn't be laying up our treasures here. Which is why we're called pilgrims, sojourners, strangers. We're not supposed to be laying our roots here the way the world does either. To resume a lifestyle of worship. If you've never had a lifestyle of worship, to build one, to set yourselves aside, to consecrate yourselves to God, and to make Him your focus in all things. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, that's the most encouraging thing that I think I can see in all of the Word. Second most encouraging thing. First one's the most encouraging. It starts with God. If it comes with us trying to plan a revival. <laughs> who was with me when we were trying to plan for our Halloween night, a circus, but lessons learned, we'll sort things out for next year, because you can't plan for something like that, so knowing that God is taking that work, God is doing that work, God is calling that work, he's equipping for that work, that's amazing, but two, who do I go talk to for a revival, we got to make flyers, we got to deal with Facebook, we got to deal with TikTok, or whatever that, is that the right one, TikTok, and whatever else, and put it in magazines and run around, stick those annoying flyers in people's windshields that you end up getting cited for because they end up on the side of the road. Who do you start to witness to? Where does my ministry begin? Where does a ministry as heavy as a revival is a lot? Reformation is a lot. You look through the church's history, those two things, those are heavy. As we went through the book of Acts, it's rightfully said that the the apostles, they turned the world upside down. But how do we start that? Started with the head of the household, with Jacob. You cannot lead your household in the way of the cross and into truth if you do not possess that in yourselves. A half-hearted righteousness, a half-hearted dedication will never, ever be a match for worldliness. Period. So it starts with Jacob. And where does Jacob take that to? His household, our first ministry, even mine, is to my wife and to my children. And we spend a great deal of time throughout the week raising my family up in the Lord. Bible studies with the kids. Bible readings with the kids. If you don't know how to do that, come and see me. We have great, all manner of resources to take you through that process it starts in the home and it doesn't just stop with Jacob's household but it also says all those that were with him so it starts with the head of the household goes into his family and essentially those that were with him it goes into kind of his his business counterparts you can kind of see how that's starting to spread starts in an itty bitty bubble and that bubble starts to expand just like it did with the disciples in the book of Acts what does Jesus tell them you're going to start here local, Jerusalem, Judea. That's local stuff. Then to Samaria, and then to the ends of the world. And that's what we see through the book of Acts, how the gospel started in, in a small circle and went all the way to Rome. So verse 2. Jacob said to his household and to all that were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. 
purify yourselves and change your garments and change your clothes. So we see what God had given to Jacob, and now Jacob is taking to his family. First thing, put away foreign gods. That word for gods in um, the text here is Elohim. There was a whole bunch of them. That's plural. Elohim. Where did they get those? Generally the same place we get all our bad habits. One from the company we keep outside of the home or two from our parents. We know that Isaac's wife ran off with Jacob's wife, sorry, ran off with the gods of her father, ran off with Laban's teraphim, the little wooden idols he had in his house. Remember, she stuck it in the saddle. She sat on the saddle. Laban went walking around searching all the tents. And what did she say? Well, it's the, the, the manner is upon me, so I really can't get up. You'll have to forgive me. So she lies to hoard the gods and their worshiping. Not to mention, Shechem was very polytheistic. Most of that region was. Tons of different gods. It was allowed in the house. Interesting thing about allowing something, it only goes along so far until you stop allowing it. The problem we have is like, well, it's gone on for so long, it would just be weird if I stopped it now. And we do that everywhere in our life, don't we? We pick up weird habits we don't get rid of because it's just too late. Weird things that we do, traditions, whatever it is. It is far, far better to put your foot down in the hard and right thing than to continue to let it sit there and to fester and to cause decay, especially in the household. So to put away those gods, we have a hard time with that passage. Why is that? We don't, as far as generally speaking, American culture, we don't have gods, plural. We have God, singular, so we kind of let these verses just kind of wash away from us. The problem is anything that we put ahead of the worship of God has become an idol in our life. We want to see revival in our households. We want to see revival in our church family. Put away all of the junk that has nothing to do with Christ. That would be the, one of the greatest steps we could accomplish as a church, as a, not just this fellowship, but a fellowship as a whole. So put away the gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. We're pretty familiar with that one. But we are a new creation. We are to put away the old things. The old things are dead and gone. The old sinful man is supposed to be dead and gone. What's interesting is how this is in the heart of Jacob. This is not what God told Jacob. But Jacob seems to understand it. They're going down as a new creature. The garments, the things that we're used to wearing in this culture, we're going to completely put those things away and go into something clean and make our way south. Almost a similar kind of idea. You remember with Moses standing on holy ground, what did he have to do? Hey, take off his shoes, take off his sandals. The ground he's standing on is holy. We don't want to track any of that dirt with us as we're making our way. Complete disconnect from all worldliness. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel. That's the hard part, at least for some of us, to actually have to get up and to go do something. It's easy to pray. It's easy to talk. It's easy to make small changes, but to actually get up and go would be hard. And now he's getting up and going with such a large group that already has kind of this plan A of disobedience. I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. Man, that is amazing. Jacob recognizes that God has been with him the whole time and that God is going before him. One of the hard parts of revival, and especially one of the hard parts of reformation, coming back to a solid truth, you have to know it. 
there's a lot of really weird, weird teachings. Some of them are absolutely destructive. Some of them just a matter of interpretation. Some of them are a matter of feeling. But one that is gaining a lot of ground is sensationalism in the churches. How entertained are you going to be when you come here? One of my favorite videos, and not favorite in a good way, um, is Drunk in the Spirit. And there's a pastor, a female pastor, that gets up on the stage, and she pretends like she's drunk, and she's rolling around on the stage while trying to teach, laughing and gigging like an idiot, kicking over the worship equipment. And you can hear, above what it is she's trying to say, the laughter of everybody else that's in the building. Well, I can't control it because I'm drunk in the spirit, which is odd because what's one of the fruits of the spirit? Self-control. Mm. How do we fall for that kind of nonsense? Dancing around with snakes or doing backflips. I don't like snakes, and I don't really have the acrobatic <laughs> skill, so you don't have to worry about any of that. But how do we fall for that kind of stuff? We don't know. One of my favorite-ish, I know I say it a lot, deal with it. One of my favorite sections to discuss is the contrast, or lack thereof sometimes, between the, the Antichrist and Christ. And a lot of people get the first writer out of Revelation chapter 6. Well, that's Jesus. He's on a white horse, and he has a bow. He's going to conquer. Jesus is going to be on a white horse. Jesus is going to have a sash. Jesus is a conqueror. Jesus has a crown. So a lot of people teach that first writer is Christ. And it paints a, an awful picture. And it skews our expectation and our interpretation through the rest of that text. How do you know? How do you know that I'm not teaching you something weird? Do we stick to Acts 17.11? Do we go home and do the research for ourselves? Do we stay in the Word? Do we learn the Word? Well, I'm not a scholar. I can't just learn all that stuff. Go to church or just read your Bible a lot. Cover to cover. Once you finish it, go again. No, you're not going to know all of the ins and outs. I will never know all the ins. Nobody will ever know all the ins and outs. But you'll be able to recognize when somebody is teaching something that contradicts the word and the message of Christ. So we see Jacob reiterating to them, this is the guy we're going to. I built an altar there before at Bethel when he appeared to me when I was in my day of distress. So not only is he trying to reveal or to input truth into the situation, but he's also letting them know, this is the God that helped me through my time of distress. This is a time of distress. Why is this a time of distress? We're going to get into that one at verse 5. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands. Obedience. That's one of the next steps of revival for us. Lord, we want to see a revival. What's God doing? Me too. Lord, I want to continue walking closer to you. Draw, draw near to me. I want to draw near to you. You tell me in your word, in the book of James, those that draw close to you, you draw close to them. Lord, that's what I want, a deeper relationship. So what's the Spirit going to do? The Spirit's going to start his hedge work in the believer's life. That's a painful process. There's things in the believer's life that does hinder us. It hinder us from sharing the gospel. Hinder us from growing closer to Christ. That matter of obedience is a very hard one. But they gave to Jacob. They didn't just give. They gave all of it. They put it in Jacob's hands. And the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree. Which was by Shechem. Completely left them behind. Why the earrings? I don't know. The earring, which is also the same word for a nose ring, a lot of people point out, well, it's a matter of possession. I get that. Whatever it is with the earrings, I'm not saying, you know, if you're wearing an earring, then you're some kind of a Christian fallout weirdo. It's not what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with earrings. Whatever is going on with this text and those earrings, it was somehow tethered to the pagan culture that they had at that point in time. What does that really mean? Again, I have no idea. But for whatever reason, it was bad, and they left them there. And they journeyed 
And the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. That's why I believe Jacob kind of instills that concept of who answered me in the day of my distress. They're in one of the more northern sections, right? They decimated all the males in Shechem. That's going to make some people very angry, especially what Shechem meant for that area as a hub. They killed all the males in that area. They took as slaves the rest. They completely pilfered Shechem. So as you're moving through the rest of the neighboring areas, people have family everywhere. We have family, just those of us that are in Baker, we have family spread all the way to the north. We have family spread to the south. We have family in Caldwell. You can just imagine what they want to do to the sons of Jacob who can't protect themselves. What's interesting is even as they are journeying, we still see God blessing them as they are being disobedient. It kind of highlights um, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7, when a man's way pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. I believe that is why Jacob includes that. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel. Because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. I really like that one. El Bethel. God of the house of God. That's important for us as a body. Not just in the concept of revival or reformation, but always. It would seem that Jacob was quite a bit impressed with the location the first time he was there. He built the altar. He had the dream. He saw the stairway to heaven. And the angels ascending and descending, showing that constant work with man. And Jacob was just, oh, this is the house of God. It's easy to get impressed with the house. And we lose sight of the God. It would seem that Jacob has a different focus, but God of the house of God. I'm not saying we should let the building fall apart in shambles, but if you're more focused on the physical things here, we're kind of missing the point. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Alon Bakuth, or terebinth of weeping. Then God appeared to Jacob. Again, when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. We do see that God blesses obedience. But I like very much that we see the Lord coming to Jacob when he loses Deborah. Deborah would have been a big deal because she was with him the whole time. Seeking God in our sorrow, seeking God in our suffering is pivotal pivotal for the life of the believer. Because one, God uses that suffering and we grow by it. So much so that we are able to bless and pour out into somebody else that's going through the same thing. But two, and I spent a lot of time doing it, and I'm sure some of you have too. Going to the Lord with our grief is a lot better than going to the world with it. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you. And kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you and to your descendants after you, I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he had talked with him. Great passage. I love that passage because God doesn't give him anything new. He's recited the same promise that he recited for Isaac. Recited the same promise for Isaac that he did for Abraham. My friends, we don't need new information. What we need is familiarization with the old information. Be in our words consistently. 
wrongly I hear people teach or say or demonstrate, well, you can't be saved unless you go to church. That's just stupid. And we covered that one a lot as we went through the book of Romans. What you need is Jesus. Well, then what's the point of me coming to church? I can know Jesus just as well from my couch as I do from going to church. I would beg to differ. I've had a lot of conversations with couch ninjas. They need to be in church. A church is teaching through the word in fellowship with people that want to draw closer to Christ and want to be disciples and want to be in the ministry of the word. But we don't know the word. Or those of us that know the word, we forget. And it's that simple. And as we forget, as we stray, we notice that things kind of get harder and harder especially as we see ourselves trying to do it by ourselves, forgetting the family that we have here and forgetting the word that's in front of us. So it's nothing new. The Lord reaffirms the promise that he has given, not a new one. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. That's a symbol of just being poured out. We're going to see that as a drink offering as we make our way through the, um, a portion of Leviticus. But we see even Paul discussing it in his, well, I think his last epistle, I think in 2 Timothy. They knew his life was being poured out as a drink offering. One of those last portions of revival. Once you are saved. Once you establish that relationship with Christ or come back into that lifestyle of worship, you have to understand, when you call Jesus Lord and you call Jesus King, you're calling yourself a servant. He is King. That makes us servants. What do servants do? Stuff. <laughs> Whatever it is he's calling you to do. Are you willing to be poured out? Are you willing to have your life fully used as you are fully consecrated to God are you ready to have your life poured out for the use of God and they journeyed from Bethel and then and when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath Rachel labored in childbirth and she had hard labor and it came to pass when she was in labor that the midwife said to her do not fear you will have this son also and so it was as her soul was departing for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni, or son of sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. How important it is to draw closer to God. Even, and it's really important to mark that note, even in obedience and into here in the text, kind of that full consecration to God, he still has sorrow. That does not change for the life of the believer. You will still have trials, persecutions, hardships, fire, Sorrow, mourning, death. You're still going to have all that stuff. But we don't mourn without hope. As believers, we are, we are, we are empowered to function differently in hardship. We're empowered to live and to operate outside of that circumstance outside of that environment how important that is for benjamin that would have been horrible to grow up with the name ben oni when we are in a place of fear hardship persecution pain suffering we typically respond in kind we've tried to speak with people in their grief and or their anger and what typically happens they're gonna get your head bitten off when we're hurting we respond in hurt when we're angry, we respond in anger or in sarcasm, sublanguage of anger. She names her son, son of sorrow. 
That would have been horrible to grow up with. But he renames him Benjamin, son of my right hand, son of my power, son of my authority. That, that place on the right is always that place of that picture of authority. Verse 22, and it happened when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. It's kind of a weird little insert. In verse 22, Rachel passes. These are the 12 sons. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention. Reuben did something stupid. Why? In Rachel's passing, we're going to see that Isaac will be passing in verses 27 through 29. And it's um, very likely that uh, Jacob is pretty well advanced in years. Reuben's making a play for the head. It's not the. This is the first time we really see it in that kind of context in the word, but it's not going to be the last. We're going to see similar issues with, especially David, and one of his sons taking his concubines to the roof of the palace. We'll get to that in five years, as long as it's taking us to get through Genesis. We will cover this more in chapter forty-nine as Jacob, Israel, is giving the blessings to his son. We're seeing the blessings fall now from three sons. Reuben being unstable as water and what he has done here in verse 22. Then we see the wrath and the anger and the bloodshed of Simeon and Levi. So where does that promise go to? The fourth son, Judah. Again, we'll dig more into that one in chapter 49. Then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kerjath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. So Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob bearing him. So we see Esau, Jacob coming back together again up here to bury his father. What I do want to point out with Isaac, he thought he was going to die like 45, 50 years ago. Don't rule yourself out early. God's got a fantastic sense of humor. There are things we can't do. One of my favorite just stories of the ministry, it's not my story, but um, rather that of uh, Chuck Smith. Um, he had a gal that traveled the world in missions all the time. And she was bedridden. Eventually, she was rendered just fully paralyzed before she passed. And it broke her heart that she didn't have a ministry. She found a powerful ministry for several years just through prayer. Don't count yourself out. There's a lot of things that we can't do. There's a lot of things that we like to think we can't do. Lord, I don't talk right. I don't speak right. I don't think right. I don't look right. I, don't, I can't, you know, clean properly, but maybe I can do that. God's got something for you to rule yourself out because of something that you see as a life-changing infirmity that completely rules you out of the ministry or a chance to serve. You're robbing yourself of a blessing and a great joy. Chapter 36. Relax, it's only 43 verses. We can do this. Now, this is the genealogy of Esau. Who is Edom? Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan, Adah and the daughter of Elon the Hittite, Holy Obama, the daughter of Anah, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite, and Basemuth, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. Now Adah bore Eliphaz to Esau, and Basemath bore Reuel. Re, yep. And Holy Obama bore Jush, Jalam, and Korah. These were the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the persons of his household, his cattle, and all his animals, all his goods, which he had gained in the land of Canaan, and went to a country away from the presence of his brother Jacob. For their possessions were too great for them to dwell together, and the land where they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau, Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. That's kind of important when underlined. 
And this is the genealogy of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. These were the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, son of Adah, the wife of Esau, and Ruel, the son of Basemath, the wife of Esau. And the sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. Now Timnah was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These were the sons of Adah, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Ruel, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These are the sons of Basemath, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Aholiobamah, Esau's wife, the daughter of Anah, the daughter of Zibion, and she bore to Esau, Jewish, Jalam, and Korah. Verses 15 through 19 are the chiefs, or something like the sheiks of Edom. 20 through 30, the sons of Seir, and 31 through the rest of the chapter dealing with kings of Edom and of the chiefs of Esau. Told you we had time. <laughs> Why is that in there? It's a great question. Yeah. Why is this in here? God always keeps his word. You remember when the mother of Jacob and Esau, she was pregnant and she was having some just abnormal issues during her pregnancy. So she, what did she do? She sought the Lord. Lord, if this is from you, why is this happening? So what did God tell her? There are two what in your womb? Not two dudes, not two boys, not two persons. Yeah, nations. There are two nations in your womb. God is in chapter 36, gives seven generations of Esau. Seven, and we've seen it a lot, those of you that uh, were with us through the book of Revelation, see seven, a lot, lot, lot. And everyone says, well, seven's God's number. I'd be very careful with that particular assigning. Seven through the word is the number of completion. God has completed and kept his promise. Esau truly is a nation. Two, Esau did not give a rip about the spiritual things. He did not care about the blessing. That's the hard thing for us, isn't it? We struggle with the mercy and the grace of God. Lord, he doesn't believe anything. Why is he so blessed? Why am I less blessed? The book of Proverbs, we're told not to be envious of the violent, envious of the wicked, envious of the unjust, because it's easy to be. Lord, I go to church twice a week. A third time I go to study. I help prepare the communion. I scrub the toilets. I give money to people. I put clothes in the bin that's out there for the Rachel Pregnancy Center. So why does that dirt bag have cooler stuff than I do? Not only do we sometimes have a poor understanding and outlook of the mercy and the grace of God but we have a poor understanding of what a blessing is if we see our blessings in our stuff <laughs> we're looking at the wrong thing because that's not where it is even though Esau had no care about the promises or the will of God God blessed him and kept his word to him anyway what a powerful concept There was a third thing, but I don't remember what it is. So we're going to make one up. In verse 11, we see, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. That's a very fought over word. What does that mean? I am God Almighty. The first thing to really look at, especially as we know, we know we're going to talk about a lot on Sunday, so don't skip Sunday, but we're called salt, something of a preservative. That gets really hard, especially when we forget who it is that's calling us to do the work, who it is that's empowering us for the work. There's a very hard thing in front of Jacob, and Abraham shows up and says that I am God Almighty. So not only almighty or overshadowing one is what a lot of renderings will kind of point to, 
but they also think it's probably a derivative of an Akkadian word, which means all-sufficient one. My friends, we cannot be jaded about the idea or mistaken that we are headed for something very difficult. We'll be covering it quite a bit in depth once we get into the Olivet Discourse in Mark chapter 13. Eschatological views and teachings and doctrine. When my brother called me asking about the school board, he's like, this is what we're teaching. And this is what Shay did, my niece. She wrote two. So she failed the test. I don't good for you. But the question I was not really, and I should have been, is what it is. But he asked me, what do I do? It's not the question I was prepared for. What do I do? That is a hard question. What it sounded like is, how does the ant fight the ocean? We forget that God is almighty. We forget that God is all sufficient. And we really shouldn't. Because if once we start forgetting that God is almighty, the giants in front of us seem way bigger. I don't want to be someone afraid of the giant. I want to be like Caleb. The dude was like 90. What did he want to do? He wanted to climb up into the mountains and fight giants when they were going. To, you ladies, you're moving through the book of Joshua. You get to see all that fun stuff. A guy in his advanced years wanted to fight giants. He wanted to do the hard stuff. My friends were praying for a revival. We're praying for a reformation. So, Lord, ready us for it. Those are great prayers. But I would invite you and encourage you to add to them. Maybe even to change them a little bit. That you, that we would be ready. For us to bring revival, you have to remember God uses broken, leaky vessels to accomplish his. That's us. That's me. That's you. He's going to use you. Lord, I want to be used for a revival. That is a hard prayer. Because odds are we all have something in our lives that is going to hinder us in it. And God's going to ask you. The Spirit is going to prick you. It's time to give that up. It's time to repent. So I encourage you to pray that way instead. Because we are going to see something of a revival. I really hope that we see reformation, even in light of the coming great apostasy. But it's also a portion of workers in the harvest. That is our function. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And Father, I'm very thankful for people that are hungry for your word and desire very much, God, as disciples, through the ministry of the word and of your spirit, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of you. And Lord, I do pray for a boldness. We see a great deal of things, God, that you have warned us about. All through the course of our history and all through the course of your word, that these things are coming and that we have work to do. And I pray, Father, we would move forward in obedience as Jacob has done here in this chapter, a separation from the world, pursuing the path, Lord, that you have in front of us. And I pray, Lord, that as we do take those hard steps, we would never lose sight of who you are. And we love you and we praise you and we pray in your name. Amen. God.